I've done a book called Objects of Obscure Desire um, for Mike Goldmark in Uppingham. And as usual, it's one of those strange, fortuitous accidents. I, I was doing, editing a huge book called London City of Disappearances, which was a notion of the, a whole vast city of memories and erasures, cultural erasures. I thought everything was disappearing. And this, but this was on the grand scale, the epic panoramic scale. And at the same time, because Mike talked to me at this point and said that he wanted to get back into publishing, I thought it'd be very nice to take one element of this book but bring it down specifically to me and in fact my own room that, where I was writing and to look at certain objects that hadn't disappeared but which um, represented points in my own life that had disappeared. The room was itself more and more of a rubbish dump, a kind of scavenged rubbish dump, a grave with a library attached. Mostly it's a room in which archaeology goes on, the endless searching, memories of, um, there must be this object somewhere, I can remember it, and you turn out all these drawers and you tip through all these boxes, thereby creating ever more chaos. And if I was eventually going to disappear entirely into dust, all that would be left were these objects, and from those objects someone else could create a narrative, a fiction of my life if they wanted to. So I was getting in ahead and doing it first. Out of the hundreds of items in his room, Sinclair chose to focus on 12 objects, including a whalebone box, a piece of South American pottery, and a silver monkey. I felt that there was a process of ventriloquism going on, and that I was only articulating the, the narratives of a series of curious and random things that had arrived from different places at different times. I'm taking these objects as if they have some meaning to, that, that will reveal itself to me if I can write the words in the right or, order, so, so that each, each short text is like a kind of magical spell or formula, that if it works and it sits alongside the next one, putting the two things together creates a third meaning that you can't, can't anticipate till you do it. But as he wrote about them, Sinclair found that the twelve objects were hemming him in. That the objects become a ring, a satellite ring around the writer, and to break out of that is going to have consequences of some sort. I felt that's what the book needed in the second part, to, to uh, make the energies less claustrophobic. So you, you would break out of the ring and what, what would happen. Sinclair broke the ring by moving into his favourite territory, the landscape of London. I wanted that to, to change the tone and to challenge the, the way that you read the book. You think in the first part, this is a particular person almost journalistically describing particular objects. And then what happens then again when he moves out into the city? By moving into the city, you become a fiction. And in the argument between the interior and the exterior, the willed and the accidental is, is the structure and the energy and the dynamism of whatever I've tried to do. The second half of the book describes a series of significant landmarks that Sinclair encountered walking south from Hackney. Each location acts as a marker as he travels towards his inevitable destination and the resolution of the book. My general way of moving is down towards the Thames. I'm very drawn down towards the Thames. But to progress towards the Thames, you have to break a series of rings which stop movement. And I think each time you go over one of these barriers, um, you undergo some form of spiritual alteration. The molecule pattern shifts and rearranges itself. Sinclair went on to invite artist Sarah Simlet to produce a series of delicate line drawings as a visual parallel to his text. It was very clear from the beginning that uh, um, what was so exciting about this was that Ian really was inviting me to collaborate with him and to work with him on creating uh, some visual ideas uh, to go with his text. And he was not asking me to just produce page illustrations of whatever he was thinking of. So it was a collaboration. It, it very much felt like that. One of the objects that Ian presented me with was a photograph of Anna seated in a boat on the River Thames. And in the same text I found reference to the idea of a river of dust flowing through his study, washing away his memories. 
I decided to try and chart the whole of the length of the River Thames as if it was made of particles of dust. So this is, is as accurate as I could manage, um, mapping the Thames from its source right the way down to, to the river mouth in the tiniest little dots that my pen was capable of producing that I also thought the printer would be able to pick up. The drawings as they appear in the book are exactly the same size that I made them and they are miniature in many ways, they're about this sort of size. And the purpose was that they needed to fit with the text and not overwhelm it, but they also, I wanted to create that sense of intimacy and of looking in and of them being quietly present. I never felt the need that every single aspect of the book should be covered visually. The visual thing should be a palimpsest that, that you're, you're looking at this almost tracing paper and there's a little bit of evidence here, there's a little bit of evidence there. There are obviously things missing as much as there are things missing in describing my room in terms of 12 objects out of thousands and thousands of objects. Really the, the essence, the dynamism of the book is in holding on to these strange and obscure objects as against a total cultural amnesia in which these kind of things would have no place, they wouldn't exist. It's not just nostalgia and it's, it's nothing to do with heritage, it's just, just to do with honouring things that, that have a reality and that are likely to be swept away.